Um, I put together this paper for this workshop. I'm thinking, uh, actually, I, since my first day uh, of doc graduate study in this country, I'm interested in the idea of ephemeral, ephemeral architecture. So, one thing, I think one point I want to make in this presentation is uh, to critique about architectural history, especially architectural history of modern China. I think that history uh, is still the humanist history. It's not materialist history. It's pay less attention to the materiality of the city. Um, so that history, architectural history, is a history of architectural profession and the monuments that pays little or little attention to the everyday built environment that took form and disappeared in a fluid urban process. Right? So in this process, I bring in this idea of ephemera and ephemerality. So to critique that history, humanist history, to, and to write a materialist history of modern Chinese architecture, is to document and understand the fluid urban process in which the ephemeral structures, many of which uh, were built without any involvement of architects, how the, in which these ephemeral structures took form, transformed, and disappeared. The visual and textual records of such ephemeral structure are ephemeral too. Sketches, postcards, casual photographies, uh, photographs, travel writings, and the news reports. Now, these records often uh, report some minor events that we traditionally uh, not consider as worthy of historians' attention. For these minor events, uh, the buildings, architecture, and cityscapes are mere setting, the, the idea of the setting, the set, right? It precisely is precisely setting, uh, like stage set, right? The setting and it's in relation to the event that we can explore in order, in order to write a materialist history of city and architecture. I think the history that merged into the setting rather than, rather than coming out of it in the form of heroic characters, objects, or narratives. Now, I think this is the idea I get based from what Benjamin's idea of natural history. So like happening in everyday life, the city's built environment is always transient. While the monument as the eternal transport, a manifestation of political or religious will is either illusion or exception, the contradiction between monument and ephemera is also that between the city as utopia and the city as history as a real process. For example, uh, the eternal city of a room has this double character. On one side, in utopian imagination of antiquity, right? On the other hand, in the real, it's material, because it's mighty ruins, in the room. It's mighty ruins testify to the history of political decline, the decline of the Roman Empire, and also the material decay. So that, that, that's true history. Uh, history of utopia, and history of materiality. Uh, the modern city of bourgeoisie, that's our topic, the modern city of capitalism, also combines utopia and ruins. Um, the, end, there to, the utopia is a changing dream world of consumerism. And uh, for the ruins, even more transient physical spaces of trade and commerce. That's why Benjamin, I think, is a, a very uh, well-known arcade project. Uh, uh, he considers abandoned Parisian arcades be the paradigmatic space for modernity, precisely because this space, this type of space, combined utopia and ephemera. Uh, its practical purpose was an investment to generate revenues and profits by creating a dream world of consumerist utopia. But once this purpose has been achieved, arcade was abandoned and investors sought to create a new commercial ephemera. In the, light of the, in light of the new ephemera, the lingering physical traces of the arcade become dated, archaic, and dystopian. 
So I think I did dating utopia turns into dystopia before it is redeemed as a side of romantic nostalgia, or more critically, uh, as you know, uh, or uh, a, a side of materialist history. I think that's Benjamin's project, not treated as side of nostalgia, but rather a critical force begin to, to, to write a different history, the art history, the history that's unadorned and uh, imaged, that in a standstill, a history that's more truthful, probably less meaningful than the, the, uh, the new conventional history. So, uh, nostalgia would discover poetic ruins, poetic ruins, but the material history uncovers the utopian mask of capitalism. Okay, that is a bit of a theory of art. Uh, the, 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 I think some some theory, uh, uh, some idea I take from Benjamin. But let, let's move on to China. Okay, um, traditional architecture in East Asia was built with ephemeral materials such as wood, straw, bark, and mud. Even the major ritual and the political monuments such as imperial palaces, um, sacred temples, or all wooden buildings, with some uh, semi-enduring permanent uh, components, such as painted columns, tile roof. But, but, but these all subject to decay and rebuilding over time, and were categorically different from European monumental architecture. So like palaces and temples, Chinese houses, as in the public meat house, the gentry house, uh, 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 think about courtyard houses, right? the, 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 this domestic space were also spaces of ritual, domestic rituals that honor family ancestors and lineage. Uh, their orderly courtyard, garden, reproduced ritual space of the palace and temple in a smaller scale. Uh, the courtyard space it's a monument, I think it's also a monument, but it's a monument of void, it's not a solid monument. It, it, it's a space that, that is framed by the wall, that is a monument, because it's a monument, it's a space of ritual, and the ritual repeat uh, and, 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 uh, without change. At least that's an idea, that's an idea. Uh, so surrounded by holes and walls of ephemeral materials, this space, this courtyard, signified and changing Confucian social order as a utopian space, but it's a real space. Um, probably I should use what it's utopian, but it's utopian. But in contrast, now I move on to my, this, my topic is talking about short houses. So I mentioned courtyard because I have contrast court, short houses, long street, where is a courtyard? So in contrast to the walled Confucian space, orderly courtyard, the network of commerce and trade that connects towns and villages, uh, collect these towns and villages, were usually described as a, flo a floating world, where itinerant merchants led obscure existence along streets or canals. Indeed, the courtyard and streets were, were and in that a categorically different space, separated by the walls. One represents the unchanging EV order, the other is transient and formless. Right? The one in the center, the other always marginalized. Uh, thus, the house, temple, and palace, they form represent the center, with courtyard was in the center. But the shop houses along the street were uh, these two types are contrasting uh, architectural types assigned to central and marginal positions. Uh, as I actually yesterday I talked with Angela talking about in Chinese space, inside and outside. So I use the word center and periphery, but we can also use the Chinese concept of name and why actually the power is always in the name, the center, hidden, uh, protected by the wall, but it also represented the unchanging, but on the streets outside, more ephemeral. Um, so anyway, so I move on to show houses. So show houses built along the streets were simple wooden buildings with one side fully open onto the street. 
exposed display window and entrance. Big shop signs, where you already have most prominent visual, feature, visual features, are uh, in the shop site. The signs are also uh, typically ephemera. ephemera. Big shop, uh, shopkeepers, where you are hardworking entrepreneurs, that live in the shop houses. But after they prosper, they will have to buy fields and build courtyard houses and become assimilated to the gentry farms. You know, the merchant will look down upon. So uh, the shop house then really function as a temporary stop on the path uh, to, to attend the gentry status. So this type is essentially a kind of transient space with the infirmary. Now let's move on to Shanghai in the late Qing period. Uh, in, the foreign, uh, in Shanghai, as foreign settlements are different from the traditional Confucian uh, social order, in that the comparador class, you know, the comparador, re uh, replaced the traditional Mandarin and gentry at the top of the social hierarchy. And merchants, prosperous merchants, they did not have to buy the gentry st status. For their social prestige was purely tied to money and wealth, not to the gentry status. But that's a big change in Shanghai. Uh, the city's commercial development also changed the spatial hierarchy of the courtyard and street. The street became a more important space, is infinitely extended and central to everyday life, while houses have to open itself in order to be a sustainable unit in the city. The most common type is uh, it's called Yilong, but Yilong is houses, but it's also mixed with commercial functions. Essentially, you can get into the type I'm talking about, shop houses. But just a bit uh, like great shop house, I'm interested in that in shop house not only in China, the Chinatown, Southeast Asia, this type is very, very uh, uh, commonly seen in any Chinese settlement. Just that, that simple house, fully open. So in Shanghai, uh, let's uh, see that image of a uh, house. Uh, uh, so in Shanghai, the show house are only two two stories, right? Uh, like uh, actually, this house just like any vernacular uh, town, traditional vernacular uh, period town in Jiangnan region. So the show house shops in Shanghai uh, are only two stories. Uh, the second floor is uh, uh, used as dormitories or storage. The first floor only open to the street. Uh, the usually from the uh, street front of the Nilon uh, is image. You can see this is the Nilon entrance. But you know, really, the, 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 this we're looking at a very dense uh, urban quarter, right? Uh, so the real the, uh, the the real estate price is very very uh, high. So you see. So many content, so many commercial content were packed in this small space. Now, this story is from uh, uh, is published in Genshi Tai Papa, right? Uh, in 1884. So it's in, uh, 1884, officially. So what you see here, uh, but here is the entrance to a theater, right? You can see actually this uh, this advertisement for the actor's name, uh, uh, Min Ju. This is the tea house. The tea house is actually second floor, uh, is the name of the tea house. Uh, here actually is a Jing Chi Jiang Cha. Jiang Cha is, uh, uh, you know, it's, they have a floor like a civil dispute. But anyway, they can be, become very nasty, so they forget. So you enter here the tea house. Uh, what you see here, here is like our ATM. <laughs> it's, it's a little bag. <laughs> Chen Zhuang, right? Uh, but here is entrance to the to the to the residential compound. But here you see the sign is all the name of the forty cents. Uh, here is the name of the Yilong, Qing Yi, right? Here is a little boot shop, the boots of umbrella. But you see how many shops here? They're all packed in this uh, very small section of the street. Uh, right. Now um, let's see this drawing. This drawing is actually done by Liu Wei. Simon Wu, the famous uh, uh, illustrator. Now, this story is a snapshot of a section of Stone Road, Shiru, uh, and it's today's Fujian Road, near Lanjiu. Um, 
So it records a net chain commercial space and then let it disappear. And this, I think that's what the real space we forgot. We can't really identify any names there. So what we can't identify the courtesans, the theater, the tea house, even with their names recording the void, we just don't have any more records of them, as far as my research goes. Uh, we can only assume that this was a typical street front and its fluid, fluid change does not have any historical meanings. This does a major uh, so it's different, it's not a recording of a big wall, you can read the event. It's just everyday uh, uh, thing that people forgot about it, but just reporting in pictorial as as anecdote. So the story, what's the story? The story is uh, reported here is a, a former official, uh, as you see here, he's wearing an upper dress at the, the club. A former official, uh, he fell into poverty and worked as a rickshaw porter and uh, living in the city. The drawing shows that he comes to take a customer who calls for a rickshaw, but he recognized him, his customer, uh, as uh, his former assistant. So he was still embarrassed, so he, he ran away. Uh, from from this this person, but this is it's a street drama. This street drama of changing fortune is a well of uh, myriad everyday happenings in the modern city. Right, the characters are passers by, passers by on the street, and worthy of remembrance as historical events. But the recurrent in the theater of the city, the city can be compared to the theater, but they merge into. Uh, they merge into the commercial setting rather than standing out of it, uh, uh, standing out of a setting like here. Now the city resembles a theater of the ephemeral performance of happenings. All happenings. The street is a stage, right? The shops are safe, are safe, stage safe. Uh, the passes by are characters. But unlike those in the normal theater, uh, the, the same the setting, stage, and character merge into one in the modern city. So in this case, we can read it as a material history. You are look, there's no hero coming out of this image. The, the characters, the shot powers, they're, they're, they're just one. Uh, they, you know, it's different from a, a heroic actor performing in front, in front of a set, right? Rather, the stage and the character, they merge together. I think this would be material history. Materialist history, uh, we do. Materialist history of the city. Pay attention to the setting into which history merges. On the other hand, humanist history always focuses on heroes come out of the setting. Anyway, so this is a shop house, but but you know, shop house today you can still see this kind of very small shop house, right? Like objects of natural renewal, ephemeral returns. The shop house has a simple room with a street from appear uh, appear on every street, right? Uh, so this is a late chain, uh, but those wooden houses were rebuilt in early 20th century. But their form still, uh, their their special type of pattern persists. So let's look at. Look at different shop house. We, we move on to 1951. Uh, assumably, this shop house was built uh, in the public period. So, it's a noodle store, a store selling noodles, uh, and also noodle workshop that produced noodles in that. Uh, in this, uh, uh, so the sign says uh, it's a noodle, a bad picture here. But on the other side, you see, it's just a typical house, yellow house. So actually here you can see a, a case, a house can be converted to a shop. So that's my idea, shop house. So that's, that's this idea of combining shops, house together. This also tell you the streets of a chain. Shops, house, house, and shops. They, they never stay the same, you know, not more. Um, just interesting, if you read all this side here, in Guangrong, Zhejiang, family, it seems to be we are talking 51, so the revolution just happened uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. So, so it could be some uh, soldiers, family, or, or uh, revolution. But again, those uh, we don't have, uh, it, it's not ephemeral, we can't really uh, get into uh, the detailed records law, so we don't know which family live here. But why I'm showing this photo, uh, 
why this photo was taken in 1951? Actually, this is only solid material records of this space. But what is interesting was what has happened after this photo. So this photo was taken not to record the material history of the shop, but rather because this place was discovered as the first place of CCP, Chinese Communist Party. So a historical event with a heroic character will come emerge from this obscure setting, a setting of really cheap uh, noodle store, if you will. But according to CCP's official history, the first congress of CCP was held here in July uh, 1921, with certain delegates, including Mao, uh, from the country, the plus representative of the Communist International. But back then, according to memory uh, uh, memoir, this was the residence of the uh, uh, two brothers, the Yi Han Jun and Yi Shu Chen. Right? But this is the area of French concession, technical area. The area was uh, 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 it's not an uptown neighborhood, but rather kind of obscure neighborhood. So let me just read, I won't go through the detail of how making that shop out into a monument. Um, but actually, when I discovered in 51, the, um, the history, well, the media was likely true, but the history of this place was forgotten by the time the, the, the army, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, took over Shanghai. This site was totally forgotten and rediscovered in 51. And then they interviewed their landlord and reconstruct the, the, what I call natural history, if I uh, briefly. The landlord called Madame Chen, in 1920, he built a small needle compound called Shu Lenyi, and it consists of two rows of houses, the front row facing Xinye Road and five units. Each unit has a one bay uh, wide and two story high and small courtyard behind the front entrance. The Ni brothers rented the two units. Uh, right after the compound was built. It was that time it was held, the, the first congress was held. Uh, but, but so, uh, in three years, the Lee brother moved out, so the landlord rented this place to a, uh, to a merchant, the merchant making the uh, a pickle store. So actually, it was a pickle store uh, before it became a noodle store. But we don't know when the pickle store was closed, when the noodle store was open, but those, again, those are literally happy on screen, nobody's in there. Historic, right? We forgot it. But I think material history, materialist history, we need to, that, that's, uh, you know, that's what really happened uh, there. But this uh, image is what I discovered, uh, this, that we make into a monument, a display space. But it's, it changes over time. Let's just show you the it during the Cultural Revolution. First, there's still, uh, Actually, first they whitewash it, and uh, then the Beijing come and say it's not it's not original work, so they restore with the brick brick work. So this is during the Cultural Revolution, and this is a poster of that place. So you can see how it changed from uh, from this <laughs> to this and this. Just today, uh, is, right? This is my photo of that. Xin Tian Di in the middle of it. So I'm uh, showing you this, uh, people know this site, but I really have to show you that it's really think about ephemera in relation to monument, right? When I say show you the first one, it just, uh, it really images it stand still. It's, a, it's, a, it's an image which doesn't have much meaning, just a little stone right there. But that's real history. But then after that, then the whole mythology of the place people gradually build up. Today in the Mecca, if you will, of the party, right? But even more interesting is, let's get to the second half of my presentation, let me say this, even more interesting, I say the making of this monument, which is totally political, um, right? Um, let me just read it. The making of the monument was a fluid urban process, which also itself changed over time. But nonetheless, a clean and uniform street front finally took form in contrast to the biggest street or residential neighborhood. 
You know, that busy street, that obscure staging, that, that, that would really represent the physical environment of that secret meeting. That was real, because the meeting didn't took place like this clean, gentrified monument. Like they, they took place in some place more like a, a dingy corner, if you will. Uh, well, we all use our memory to try to imagine that. Uh, but the site was then abstracted from the city from its materialist history, from the real history. It was reclaimed by the party as a monument in the revolutionary history. The monument is then an empty stage set. It's also a set, a stage set. They attempt to display a reinvented past by terminating the site, leaving a natural history. Only that, that photo of the Ludo store, I think, he, show us the real history, a, a fleeting glimpse of the site of material past. Anything before the photo was totally forgotten and disappeared. That example is found from the shell house. So. Now, even more interesting, in, two, uh, in 2001, the two urban blocks surrounding this monument were redeveloped into a trendy place of, uh, of leisure, and consumption known as CKD, right? Which inevitably combined historical preservation and the theme, uh, the, uh, the theme of uh, and commercial development and making the long-term architecture a theme of development. So I, you can actually compare the CKD with the monument, they use the same method, just make the uh, clean up the monument, uh, the, the neighborhood to make it more like a monument, more like a museum. Um, it's a special display. Um, if you compare, in certain ways, Indian is like the arcade, if you will. What a, uh, in, in, in Paris, the 19th century, arcade might be repaired some running down shops. Right? Here, there was whole neighborhoods, developed can be, and kicking them out and redeveloped this. So, that actually, let's let just see, to, to see some more, this also in Fujian Road, but the other parts of Shanghai, the shop house position, is the same road as that drawing in the Fujian Road. You, uh, you will be set on the same street, stone road. But you still see the long entrance, right? It's an entrance to the Yilong. You still have the same shop. It's there the type position uh, in Shanghai. But nonetheless, this kind of space becomes rare. Uh, so next topic is the the shop house, old fashioned shop house become rare, right? Um, this we're talking about the current real estate boom, the redevelopment. So old style shop house become rare today as old neighborhoods were torn down, are torn down and rebuilt, rebuilt in modern real estate types. You worry it's commercial and residential high rises. In this process, in this process, modern shopping centers and monumental facade replace the fluid street forms of shop house. Thus the entire scale of neighborhood and street is altered. And the high rise, the high rises as you see here, uh, assume a, a monumental form of architecture. This is very different from traditional small-scale wooden shop houses. So we see it's often a giant facade on which the changing displays of signs and goods are rarely seen. So the high-rises and old-style shop houses are often juxtaposed in a city of rapid change, right? Forming a cityscape of contrasting layers, right? The ephemeral and the monumental, as you see here, monumental in the back, the low rise and the high rise. Uh, the image intensifies the sense of change. The old shop houses look more vulnerable in the backdrop of high rises. They can so much disappear. While many mourn the loss of the other neighborhood, their nostalgia was inspired by faded photographs of old neighborhoods, rather than their rubbles, as you see, these rubbles too. Um, so I, 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 this is another photo, a photo we can uh, focus on, compared with two more, two other images, the, the drawing from that chain, and also the little shop. This would be another thing we can think about, I think. It's also image in stand, standstill, and 
we kind of reflect on material history. So what is material history there? It's not a heroic character. It's not a developer. Well, rather, uh, the Shokong are gone, the, uh, the original residents are gone. Uh, I, it's my field work, I, I've been here, but what, what you see there, they are migrant workers. They're trying to recycle the building material behind it. There's still people. I think that image uh, it, it is a powerful image showing a very different history from the official history of redevelopment. Um, so what I just discovered in Shanghai is that uh, whatever the level would be torn down, so people move out, they rent it out very cheaply to migrant workers for rural, rural, uh, rural area. Some are some are like even running temporary food stores that serve migrants. So, so it become a very cheap area, even in the center of Shanghai. But if you move on, this is the same area I shot. Uh, I shot this one in 2007, 2008, if I live here. Regular visit here, but, but here it's been rebuilt. This is the same area, it's gone, that is disappeared. Uh, and, uh, uh. Um, so, I, I guess my, my, my idea is to compare this old scale uh, shop house with modern real estate. Suddenly, modern real estate building like this is more monumental. Uh, right, is less less ephemeral than the traditional houses, but it, it is going to be a, a permanent monument. Um, I guess I doubt about that. So the last example we're talking about is is a uh, expo, right? So, uh, the Shanghai Expo. I mean that is a that's an interesting example because expo is a temporary event for the. Uh, So uh, the history of, now this is also a monument, if you will, in the history of Shanghai's uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, rise again on the international stage. The Shanghai's redevelopment as a global city. But that history is written with monuments such as we just seen. And as much as history of revolution, history of revolution was written with monuments. Uh, so, each new commercial development is a monument and consumer's utopia, the text form of walled compounds, interior streets, and monument of the Tsar. So um, all the high rises to show you like this, uh, all the high rise in the background, they all look like monuments. But an interesting example is uh, seem to be uh, uh, the expo, it doesn't fit into that category because most communities will be temporarily just for the effect, right? So what might tell us, uh, what this event might tell us? Now this is I shot like during, during the expo, but after that, this one I visited just uh, earlier this year, uh, is a, a, a pavilion of the fall, the Saudi pavilion. All other pavilions are demolished. So what I'm saying that, instead of, well, the official media would report this as a heroic event, but you don't look at that, you know, this is more utopian. Instead, you look at it more like dystopian, it would, after the event, you see a different history, different meaning for that. Um, so I'm going to read my uh, visit. So visiting the park, well, I mean, I'm visiting the park in October 2000, during the festival, I saw uh, splendid architectural spectacles lying on the avenues, teeming with domestic tourists, many of uh, those tourists queuing up to visit some popular pavilions. Inside the pavilion, uh, people are even get stamps on it, passport, right? But I uh, visited the park in June 2012. I entered the park from a subway station. I first read, read it by a hawker. The hawker is also a migrant worker. He, he tried to sell me a fully stamped uh, passport. Uh, fully stamped, 50 yuan. But I don't want to buy it, but in the end, it just chased me all the way to the, to the China community. Eventually, he wanted just 5 yuan. <laughs> uh, but this one, you know, that's happening at Ephemeral, but if you pay attention to that, you can redeem that, you see a totally different side of the story from the event, you know. They're still saying possible love, uh, the same daily uh, uh, souvenir uh, in, in empty park, right? Uh, Italian Commission, Saudi Korean, that's the open, that's the open. Some tourists still try to see it, you know, they 
that is the main plan, so that still generates some revenue for them. Uh, the channel, of course, the channel committee is still open. But I talked with a park worker, they say, uh, the, the worker in the park, they say, oh, they, they, Shanghai people are always very positive about their future. And they talk to me, oh, this place in the future was so developed to the center of the tourism in Shanghai, the big future, and I'm utopia emerging from the ruined world. It's not quite the ruined, but from the abandoned park. Um, so anyway, the entire expo now look like, look dated, right? I said, Daddy, uh, uh, after the festival, after the uh, utopia, uh, and before the future development. So, so that's, that's me, uh, the city is ephemeral. It's a, it has to be an ephemeral event city, whose explicit purpose is to win the world's recognition for Shanghai and for Snowman. The official the purpose of this, this expo was to make Shanghai a global city. That, that is an uh, experience. That's not a real purpose. The real, real, uh, well, real purpose is, you know, the expo is already passé. We're talking expo is uh, London in 1853, 51. Paris in uh, 1931, age of great world exhibition. The world really pay much attention to the world So I say real purpose for this is give the local government a excuse to acquire a huge lot of land and then destroy so many factories and so many houses before the event and so after those are destroyed again for some future development, right? Now let's illustrate another idea, the city as a camera. The city indeed look for every opportunity to build new monuments and new utopia. It matters, it doesn't matter how long such a utopian project will last, as long as it absorbs the surplus surplus capital of the city. Uh, we're talking about Max the city. The, the city is, is all about spending this surplus capital through the process of creative destruction, creative destruction, right? So the city, I think, will continue to build ephemera just as new fragments of utopia are inserted into its fluid fabric. The city as a whole is always changing fluid. A utopia, parts, pockets of utopia, national monuments, and changing will be inserted into So I think uh, to summarize, I uh, just compare together these image, the key images. The, the, the image that doesn't have much, much meaning in that chain, that drawing of 1884, that shot from, that, that just sums, you, you still see every day, it doesn't have any historical significance. Then we see uh, the photo of the Ludo Stone. The same thing, it doesn't have any historical meaning until it was discovered as first place of CCP, right? Then the poem mythology of the best being constructed. Uh, then I show you the, the ruins of their demolished, half demolished shop house, just try to say, uh, compare that image as very different from the narrative of development, the narrative of progress, making Shanghai a new city. Again, I'm showing you the photo of the abandoned uh, expo site, again to show you a different history from the official uh, report of the event. The real purpose is not staging uh, make Shanghai more globalized, it's just practically they, they allow it, the local authority to bring so much power to to move around those, those, uh, those residents, those shop owners, so thank you on your one. Thank you.